So I welcome everybody in the room and uh, people that are connected uh, online to the today's seminar. Uh, it is a pleasure to have with us Professor Eva Wokas, if I pronounce it correctly, Eva. Perfect. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you see already the uh, Save. Cancel. Cancel. Okay. Okay. Uh, you see already the title on the screen it will be about backing stability in galactic bars. Eva, for those of you that work in galactic dynamics, is a known, very well known researcher in the field. Uh, she comes, as you see, from the Nicolaus uh, Copernicus Astronomical Center that belongs to the Polish Academy of Science. Um, she has worked in cosmology and galactic dynamics, focused in the dynamics of galactic bars, especially the central part, the peanut. Uh, you have heard several talks about the central component. Uh, and uh, the today talks about the battle instability that leads to the formation of uh, this uh, part of the galactic bars and the relation of the galactic bars and all that stuff. Uh, I see that already that there are people in the room and uh, online that are very interested in the subject. So Eva, you can start. We are uh, looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so uh, I will make it as simple as possible. I will describe what, what, uh, what I have done a few years ago, but uh, which has been recently uh, improved or extended by others. So I, I report on that and I will also um, tell you about um, uh, some uh, open questions that uh, that are still uh, unanswered. So let me um, start uh, by reminding you what uh, what is the motivation of this work. So first of all, uh, we observe that there are uh, some central parts of galaxies uh, or bars that have these boxy peanut shapes uh, that you see here uh, on this picture. One example of a, of a galaxy with this uh, very pronounced shape, a beautiful example. So the idea is to try to understand uh, what is happening uh, that produces this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, shapes. So for about more than uh, three decades now, we've, we've thought that we know what's going on. It has been uh, called um, buckling instability. This is a kind of uh, a phenomenon that uh, happens in uh, strong bars. So first, in, when we simulate the formation of the bar, we, we, we see it growing and then at some point, it um, distorts out of the uh, plane of the bar of the, of the initial disk. And we see something like uh, here on, on the left, uh, it, uh, it is uh, fluctuating a bit, this, this shape, and then it becomes, uh, the bar becomes much more thicker and uh, ends up with this uh, boxy peanut um, uh, shape in the end. Uh, the origin of this uh, instability is still controversial. Also, some people there are two schools essentially. Some people think it's a, a so-called firehouse instability, which is related to the velocity dispersion of the stars uh, in the bar, and something that is more related to um, particle um, resonances in the bar. Uh, so I'm more. Uh, uh, let me be clear about yeah more related to the uh, or um, I relate myself to this second school so I think it's uh, is related to the resonances uh, but uh, it's not obvious and um, I will try to um, uh, to tell you uh, why uh, I think it's uh, it's like this so I will describe a simulation uh, which uh, mm -hmm. You probably can, cannot see me, but it's uh, it's due to the to my camera. Probably it's not working. Hey, we try. We uh, please go on. We try to to fix a little bit the volume for the room, but we can hear you. So continue. Okay. So I will describe a simulation of a Milky Way-like galaxy that uh, it, that uh, helps to explain this phenomenon very well. This is the simplest possible approach: the collisional simulation with a disk. 
En de uh, dark matter halo, uh, of the order of the parameters of the Milky Way, so, so the dark matter halo is about 10 to 12 solar masses, and the disk is a few times 10 to 10. The scaling of the disk is about, is about 3 kiloparsecs, so a very standard simulation of the Milky Way um, galaxy, but with parameters adjusted so that uh, the bar uh, forms uh, not so very, very quickly, but uh, quickly enough to, to become strong and to uh, battle. So the usual thing that we uh, can measure about the evolutions of this evolution was followed for 10 giga years. Most of the plots that I will show will, will be as a function of time for, uh, for 10 giga years. So the simplest and the most common way to, to measure these properties of the bar or strength of the bar is to calculate the Fourier modes uh, to decompose the surface density into Fourier modes and to measure the second mode, which is the A2, the well-known A2 parameter. And so on the right here, you see the evolution of this uh, A2 as a function of radius. On the left, in the lower, you see the uh, in red line, uh, how it evolves within a fixed uh, radius of about uh, two scale lengths of the disk, so within six um, kiloparsecs. So we see that it grows and then at some point it it's uh, it drops the a2 parameter drops and then it grows a little bit again you see here also the axis ratios in the top uh, panel which also show a, a sudden jump at the about 4.5 uh, giga years uh, and this also reflects uh, itself in the in the three axle parameter which is measuring the the shape in terms of whether it's prolate or oblate. So it becomes more and more prolate, a little bit less at the time of this jump, and then more and more prolate of the bar grows. Uh, we can combine these uh, two measurements as a function of time and radius to show bar evolution in this uh, beautiful plot in color coded. Uh, this shows the strength of the bar in color as a function of radius vertically and as a function of time horizontally. So you see that the bar grows, it becomes uh, a little bit longer, a little bit stronger until about 4.5 giga years, then it becomes uh, suddenly weaker and then it grows again until uh, the end of the evolution. So this shows that there's something, something happens here about 4.5 giga years uh, where the arrow shows. And this is, buckling. So what we see when we look at this uh, surface distribution of the stars edge on, so perpendicular, we look perpendicular to the bar, uh, that at 4.5 it becomes very strongly distorted out of the disk plane and then it oscillates a little bit and about 5, five giga years is already formed this, this uh, clear peanut, uh, boxy peanut shape. Then later on about uh, 7 Giga years is distorted again on the outside. So this is the second buckling, secondary buckling event. And then at the end, it the, the, the peanut is much bigger. The, the hole, it extends uh, more than uh, seven, eight um, kiloparsecs uh, from the center of the galaxy. So we can measure the distortion uh, in many different ways. One was that I showed uh, just a second ago, but we can also make a similar plot uh, as a function of, as, 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 as for the bar mode, as a function of radius and time. And here we see uh, the distortion, the mean distortion uh, along uh, the disk in, in radial direction as a function of time. So we see that the, at the beginning it's is distorted downwards in the center, upwards in the outer part, then it's, it's inverted and then it, it's uh, dissipating or, or it's dumped. But there is some difference remaining on the outer part, which probably seeds this second buckling. And you see, see the second buckling here around seven uh, year, giga years. So the first buckling is much faster and happens closer to the center. The secondary buckling takes place in the outer part and it's much longer. And this is what we see. The, this is the one of the most interesting things. Uh, this is what we see when we look at uh, this galaxy uh, face on, and we measure the distortion uh, in the right column, the velocity uh, change and acceleration. So when we look at the distortion at the 4.5 here in the upper right, uh, you see that there is 
um, characteristic quadruple pattern, there is a distortion downwards here and outwards, uh, upwards in the outer part. And this uh, quadruple pattern is not uh, strictly aligned with the bar. So this, this is a little bit rotated with respect to the bar. The bar is always along the X axis here. But even a more interesting thing happens when we go a little bit further to uh, 4.6, five giga years here in the middle right. You see that this pattern uh, winds up. We see the distortions winding up. And then at five giga years, they're almost disappeared. In the center, they remain a little bit visible on the in the after part. And this is followed also in velocity and in the acceleration. And this uh, distortion in, in velocity, of course, corresponds to, to what, uh, what we see in the, uh, in the distortion, but it's uh, also interesting from the point of view of observation. So let me uh, make a short uh, observational interlude here from the theoretical um, considerations. Uh, let's look again closely at this um, pattern that we see at the beginning in terms of velocity. So this is the mean velocity uh, if you map it the, in the face on view. And you see that the distortion in velocity is quite significant. It's a few tons of kilometers per second. So it should be quite easily detectable in uh, spectroscopic surveys of galaxies. And actually people have tried to uh, to detect buckling in this way. There has been an attempt recently uh, with the Manga survey. And I'm showing here just one, one example. They have, um, they have measured this kind of um, uh, differences in, in velocity in, in, in a few hundred galaxies from, from this uh, survey. And on the, in the two left uh, um, uh, panels of this, uh, from this paper, uh, you see this uh, uh, prediction from the simulations they have, and on the right, the observation of one of the galaxies. And uh, the difficulty here is that we don't see these galaxies exactly face on, so we need to take care of the, uh, some kind of uh, inclination. And once you incline and you uh, filter uh, this, 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 uh, this data, you end up with something which is a little bit similar to a little bit, uh, it has some signal, let's say. So on the right, you see some, some uh, differences in the, in the velocities um, here uh, along the bar. So there is some uh, hint that there may be a parking visible, but it's not very, very convincing uh, just because of the inclination which, uh, which spoils the, the exact symmetry of this image. Now, going back to the uh, to the simulations, this is an, a simulation from, from Lee et al., uh, which was very similar to what I was showing from my own work. But they uh, um, provided some additional insight to, uh, to what I have found by looking at the velocity distribution uh, edge on. And here, what you see is the map of velocity uh, along the x-axis, so along the bar, in, but uh, measured when you look at on. So here you see the subsequent um, uh, phases of this of this evolution, and the bar the the buckling is uh, is very strong here uh, around three point four or something. So we see that at buckling there is a kind of streaming motion along x. So what is it telling us? There is also another measurement, uh, similar one. You, we again look at uh, edge on, uh, but we measure the velocity along Z, so vertically, uh, perpendicular to the, to the bar and to the disk. And we see that there is a streaming, uh, another streaming motion of this kind. So now what, what is it telling us? How can we interpret this? So when we look at, again, the displacement here, I'm showing this from my own simulation, something similar to what, what they show here, just to, to make it more or less compatible. When we look at the displacement phase on, you see that there is, um, so in, in this particular coloring, the red is negative and blue is positive always in terms of uh, displacement and in terms of velocity. 
So when we look at displacement, you see we see that the the the, the orbits or the, the bar is is displaced so that the blue uh, part is is um, uh, coming up, then it's going down and it's going up and it's going down and it's going up when we go along an orbit of a star uh, in a galaxy. You can see it here. I, I plotted an orbit like this for you here in, in 3D. When you look edge on, so in the way the simulations, uh, these, these images, these, these velocity measurements were done, we see that when we look at this uh, ellipse, but a little bit shifted, uh, we will see this kind of motion. So here on the on the, on the in the middle, as I, I rotated a little bit so that you can uh, look more face on, and on the right you see the same orbit face on. So this is just the X one typical orbit, but in uh, in X Z, so in in edge on view, it shows uh, this kind of uh, shape. And when we compare this, so we, we imagine the the stars is going uh, along this arrows here, it does this, this kind of motion. We see that we can reproduce the, what is observed in this particular uh, X, Z in, in terms of, of X. So we are doing this kind of motion here, but it also reproduces this motion along Z. So we are doing, again, this kind of motion and combined, this gives us this kind of regular motion. I hope you can, you can see this. So all this shape, the whole the whole shape can be reproduced with this kind of uh, orbits. Of course, these are well-known orbits. This has been uh, these orbits have been identified already more than thirty years ago, where uh, buckling instability was uh, studied for the first time, and these were uh, called the banana or infinity-like or something in between. So these are ban, aban, or x1, uh, v1, x1, v2. And you see here an example uh, on the right, for example, from Feniger and Friedrich, uh, this kind of orbits, and uh, so the banana, the infinity, and something in between. So here I'm showing something in between. It seems that because of this uh, little bit shift from the, from the um, uh, elongation with the bar, uh, of the electric rotation from the from the edge, uh, from the uh, direction of the bar, it has to be uh, something like this. So it has to be this something between uh, the banana and the infinity symbol. And it seems the all the in order to see this this fixed uh, uh, this this uniform this uh, pattern, uh, all the orbits, most of the orbits of the stars that are buckling should um, have to be uh, doing this kind of thing. They, they have to follow this, this kind of orbits. And now, uh, what happens next? So um, at the time of buckling, the bar is distorted. It's um, It has this orbit, but the, later on, uh, something else happens. So here I'm showing one example of orbit, uh, which I traced uh, before buckling, during buckling, and after buckling, with some periods that allowed me to measure the frequencies uh, and to study the frequency distribution for for sample of orbits. But let's see just one one uh, case here. So first of all, now uh, at the beginning, before buckling, this is the usual x one orbit with a very little um, range of amplitudes in along the z direction. But during black, blackling, it changes the shape a lot. It, it changes uh, from this uh, orbit that I showed to something more complicated. But at the end, it ends up uh, a very regular orbit, which would you call uh, you would call a pretzel or something like this. And uh, I did it for about two hundred stars in this kind of simulation, so about twenty percent of all stars that were. Uh, there, so I selected those that um, buckle actually. So they and they initially are along the bar, and they buckle in the sense that they increase their amplitudes in the z direction. And for this particular subsample of stars, I find that the frequencies uh, along the bar, along the x, and along z, along uh, the vertical direction, change. So uh, they change. You know, so this this uh, dotted line here shows the one to one. So you see that 
uh, frequencies along X uh, increase while frequencies along Z decrease. And this is a systematic train. They all the stars follow this, they obey this, this kind of um, relation. When we look also, we can also look uh, at uh, how the uh, amplitudes of this motion, of these oscillations uh, behave. And we see that, uh, so I've shown here the, the amplitude along X before uh, and L amplitude along Z before buckling and the same after buckling. So you see that uh, the amplitude uh, along Z increases, which means that the bar thickens. So there is also a nice um, difference here. There's a, like a two branches, which is, which is the, this is the, the inner part, which is already forming the uh, X shape. And this is uh, outer part, which is more, uh, not, not yet completely uh, buckled, maybe, uh, but there is a clear uh, signature of uh, increasing thickness because the amplitudes in, in Z increase. Uh, the most more interesting thing is how the uh, frequency ratio evolves. And again, here I'm showing as a function of amplitude along X, so along the bar, uh, before and after buckling. And here you see that the ratio of the frequencies z and uh, x along z and x before and after buckling were very different. So uh, this ratio was uh, a little bit uh, along two and higher. Here it's two and lower. So all these frequencies evolved, the ratios evolved down and they, in this right hand side, they, they, you see that they follow very uh, narrow uh, region. So uh, the frequency changes a little bit as you go from uh, from the inner uh, to the outer part. Uh, so this also tells us something about the kind of orbits that we have at the end. And the most interesting thing about this is that when you plot uh, the frequency along Z as a function of frequency along X before and after buckling, there's a significant change. So before buckling, they are aligned, but not so precisely. But after buckling, they're aligned very, very precisely. But they are not going to the center. So there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence and the one uh, linear relation. But there is a relation that you can approximate uh, with this formula that I'm showing here. When, uh, when I guessed that here, this, this shift here along the Z axis is uh, at least numerically close to the uh, pattern speed of the bar. Once you combine this, you will see that at the end, this relation is very well approximated by the relation between this vertical and the circular frequency, and this does not have the pattern speed in, in it. This is uh, quite of strange and uh, difficult to explain, but that's an uh, open question. How does it come and uh, what does it mean? Now, so I, here I've studied only uh, the frequencies before buckling and after buckling be because I used free, uh, free analysis. So I, I had to select some uh, uh, period of time to do the, to do the um, Fourier transforms. Uh, but Lee et al, the paper was all, uh, in the paper that I've already mentioned, they did the analysis of the frequencies at different times by actually following the orbits of stars, uh, exactly. And they found a similar thing. So before buckling, this is the relation very similar to at, two, at uh, time 2.5 giga years. They have a, a relation very similar to what they found. At the end, they have a very similar uh, linear relation, but also not going through the center. But the most interesting the thing about their finding is that at at the time of buckling, which for them is about 3.3 giga years, the uh, frequencies are exactly along the two to one resonance. So it proves that they, uh, all the orbits during buckling go to the two to one resonance, but it's only at a very short period of time during the first phase of buckling, then they evolve into uh, something else. The, at the end, they, they, they follow this kind of relation, which is even tighter just after buckling, even tighter than during the resonance. Uh, so you, another way to look at this is to uh, 
plot the ratio in terms of the, of the frequencies in terms of uh, um, histograms. And you see here on the right, uh, the, uh, the distribution of the, of the ratio of the frequencies before buckling in the top panel on the right and here after buckling in the uh, lower right. So you see that, uh, as I've said before, all these frequencies are above two before buckling, but they are below two uh, after buckling. So all they they all go from here to the other side of the two to one. So the from the, uh, the other side of the of the resonance. So you see that before buckling, very small fraction of these orbits is uh, banana like or infinitely like. But and the same is true for after buckling. There is still some some fraction of them. Uh, at this resonance, but ma majority of them before and after are have different uh, shapes. And uh, I'm just comparing here from uh, uh, my results with, with, with uh, earlier results from port tail drive. So they found similar uh, distribution of uh, frequencies after buckling. So here I'm showing again my results on the left. Here are their distributions for different Milky Way models. So you see that uh, they are a little bit different, but it's always the case that uh, this uh, resonance uh, at, at two, there is a, just a small peak, a small fraction of orbits that, that are there. And they also made a very nice uh, plot showing uh, what orbits occupy which part of the bar after buckling. And you see that this uh, banana-like orbit, so this peak at two here or here, uh, it's only present at the outer part of the bar, while in the central part you have different uh, you have different pretzels uh, with different uh, uh, ratios. Uh, here are a few peaks, so this corresponds to uh, to some uh, resonant values of the very nice pretzels. But overall, all, all these frequencies are covered. So no, no, not all the bar, all the orbits in the bar are, are this kind of kind of nice pretzels. And here you see how these different orbits uh, cover the, on the right, uh, in the color, uh, how different orbits cover the, the different distances um, from the center of the bar. So again, the banana orbits survive only in the outer parts. Now, another uh, observational interlude I would like to make a uh, very recent paper showed um, how uh, the actual orbits in the Milky Way could be, uh, what kind of orbits could be present in the, in the Milky Way bar. Uh, they took the uh, measurements of uh, velocities and position of the stars from the Gaia data, and they evolved them back in time in uh, uh, potential with the bar. Uh, a model of the Milky Way, and they found the following distribution of this kind of uh, frequency ratios that I showed. So they, contrary to what I have showed you, they have a large peak at uh, two, the banana orbits, a little bit peak here corresponding to pretzel orbits, and also there is a lot of you know, contribution at higher frequency, higher frequency ratios. And when you uh, uh, show, when they showed the where these particular orbits are present, you can see that the bananas are on the outside, bretels on the inside. Uh, but of course, these are for all stars that they had. Uh, so we cannot uh, really distinguish uh, the stars that buckle from those that, don't buckle, that did not buckle. So it's probably a combination uh, of the stars. Uh, there are actually bretels are on the inside and bananas on the outside, which which is good, which is in agreement with what the simulations are telling us. Okay, so now let's go back a little bit uh, for for a moment to so what I've shown is uh, I hope convincing that uh, actually we are having the, this two to one resonances at the buckling, the vertical resonances, and these are responsible for at least the initiation of the of the buckling. So what about this other interpretation, this uh, firehouse instability? In this firehouse interpretation, uh, people uh, try to derive a condition for the instability, and usually they end up with some condition on the ratio 
between the uh, velocity dispersion along Z and along R. And I'm showing here from, from my simulation how this dispersions evolve. And you can see that uh, the, um, the one along R, of course, increases as the bar uh, grows. Uh, the one along Z becomes a little bit um, um, larger, but there is a, a sudden change at buckling. And when you look at the ratio, there is a decrease first and then a strong increase at buckling. So what is it telling us? Is it telling us that this is the critical um, uh, thing that we have to that we have to rely the, in order to explain, or is it just a measure of the shape uh, of the of the bar that actually can be translated to to the frequency ratios that that is present and to the resonance that that is occurring at some point? It's an open question. So let me uh, now mention also a few uh, results. Uh, from other simulations, so there is also there has been a, for a long time um, a question whether the gas, uh, how the gas fraction in the galaxies uh, affects the buckling. So I did a very simple. So this has been studied by uh, Leah at some point, but here I, I um, uh, assume that there is no star formation. So I kept the gas fraction uh, constant in order to see how it really affects. Uh, the evolution of the bar, because when the stars for, form, then uh, there is a less and less gas, and it's difficult to say how the gas affects uh, buckling, because uh, by the time the bar buckles, there is uh, often no, not, not, not much gas left. So here I'm keeping the gas fraction constant, and it follows the stellar distribution, and I looked how the buckling uh, um, is affected. So these are the different, uh, these are pictures for different gas fractions. And you can see that the, with this, with this is a no uh, no gas here in the upper part, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. You see that the buckling in terms of the velocity distortion here in the right column becoming much weaker in time. Uh, in the, in the growing with the growing gas fraction, and there is almost no uh, no buckling uh, for a gas fraction of uh, 0 0.2. For for 0 0.4, uh, even the bar uh, didn't form. And here I'm showing uh, the same, uh, but measurements uh, in terms of uh, the uh, asymmetry uh, uh, A1Z along Z. So, so this is uh, showing again the same the same thing. So the, the distortion is largest for uh, for the zero zero uh, gas fraction and smallest for for high gas fractions. So this is uh, showing us that buckling is indeed uh, weakened uh, with uh, higher gas fractions. And now a little uh, about the what happens uh, in tidally induced bars, uh, of, on which I have been working also a lot. Uh, this is um, an example of a simulations uh, where we have two uh, disks, two Milky Way-like galaxies passing by each other. And one is on a prograde orbit, so the spin of the galaxy and the orbital angular momentum are aligned. One is on retrograde um, uh, orbit. And it turns out that, so I tried different uh, uh, parameters here so that to, to increase, so along um, B1 to B4 at four simulations where the strength of the interactions was, was varied. And um, it turns out that. Uh, um, the stronger the interaction, the stronger the bar as a rule. But only uh, for prograde interactions, the bar forms. And in isolation, this, this galaxy, of course, they didn't form a bar. So here's the, how the A2 evolved in these different uh, simulations. So the blue one is the weakest interaction and weakest bar. The red one is the strongest interaction, strongest bar. So you see the A2 grows. Um, strongly then drops down. And here is the uh, ratio of the velocity dispersions that is essential in this firehose instability interpretation. And this is, uh, on the right, you have uh, the, diff the images edge on of these four uh, different uh, simulations uh, on the, for the galaxy on the prograde orbit where uh, the distortion is, is maximum. So we can see that the strong bars indeed buckle, 
the weak ones, the weaker ones, uh, not so much. And uh, the there is actually uh, um, an interesting thing happening here that this uh, this weakest bar here uh, buckles a little uh, later on here the blue line in the lower left panel here, while this we, uh, next to, to this a little stronger one does not buckle and this shows maybe indicates that this ratio of the dispersions is not uh, really a discriminatory factor. Uh, of whether bar buckles or not. And what about buckling? So uh, what about these velocity fields? So they for the, here I'm showing just uh, uh, this uh, uh, edge on images again. And here the velocity field uh, face on. So you see that uh, the patterns are similar, but uh, they are a little bit more complicated because uh, there is also a spiral structure forming uh, here in addition to the bars. So there is uh, more, the pattern is more complicated than, uh, than the uh, usual uh, evolution in, in isolation. So that's uh, uh, all that I have uh, prepared. And instead of summary, I would like to pose a question and I would question some questions and I would like to have some feedback uh, from you concerning this. But of course, if you have any questions to me, I will also try to, to answer them. So first of all, what triggers the distortion of the bar? Uh, how do we go from the two to one resonant orbits at buckling to the more complicated bretzel-like orbit shapes uh, later on? And why uh, the horizontal and vertical frequencies are so tightly correlated after buckling. So why are the, why is this this relation between these frequencies uh, which is tighter after buckling even than uh, at the um, vertical resonance uh, at the beginning of buckling. So that's that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much Eva. Uh, let me now again here so that we can see okay okay so uh well uh questions uh, are already put by the speaker on the screen but uh, uh if one has uh, first of all some kind of uh, other kind of questions or a remark from the audience or from the people who are following the just Please just speak. Uh, Christos, yes, please. From Zoom, is it okay? Yes, yes, we hear you. Go on. So, well, thank you very much for this very nice talk. I mean, my question has to do with probably the mechanism of the buckling instability. So let's say it all looks like a phenomenon of either capture into resonance or maybe from what we see in the, in the earlier plots where you have the comparison between the banana orbits and the pretzel orbits and so on, may be decaptured from resonance. So essentially my, my question is, is there any understanding of the phenomenon in terms of capture or decapture from resonance? And then the question is, what is the main parameter of the dynamics that drives this. This could be, let's say, the slowdown of the bar. I mean, what is it that if you, if you think about an adiabatic change in the nature of the orbit, so if you have orbits which are resonant, and then with the change of a certain parameter it might become non-resonant and vice versa, what would that parameter be? Would that mostly be the change in the pattern speed or would that be the change in the amplitude of the bar and so on? Uh, so uh, let, me, let me come back to this uh, picture because this is showing the situation. So uh, first of all, I didn't show it, but when you when you plot a picture like this on the upper right here, when I have the distortion, uh, a little bit earlier, so you see the same pattern. So you see it a little bit weaker, but then it becomes stronger and stronger. And it ends up like this before it, it, it uh, 
So there's a uh, really a capture. So there is a there is a capture at two to one res vertical resonance, and this resonance has been shown to be quite wide uh, in this type of situ simulation. So certainly, this these orbits are doing uh, the distortion. So of course. I asked uh, in my questions, what is causing the distortion? Because we, we first of all, we need some, some distortion, we need some fluctuation for the orbits to start to be like this and then to capture others, right? Because this is, this is what, what's going on. But later on, what we see here on this, in these later stages, so at some point, this, um, this uh, pattern starts to wind up, right? So why, why does it wind up? When you, when you, uh, so there's there's a departure from from the resonance in a sense because we don't have this two to one uh, anymore. Uh, but what happens? You can understand this in terms of um, um, evolution of the uh, uh, distortion waves, right? So you can you can uh, when you when you look at to, into Bini and Tremaine, they show it in term uh, for a, for an example of a, of a warp. So they show how the warp, so um, m equal one distortion, not m equal two, would would evolve. Uh, but you can do a similar exercise here, and you and you, when you do, uh, you can uh, describe this kind of uh, evolution uh, in terms of two uh, bending waves that are that are uh, propagating in 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 this. So this these two bending waves at two different pattern speeds, and one is slow. Uh, which I think could be the one that is surviving and seeding the secondary buckling, but one is uh, fast, and this is the, the fast one that we see here, right? Which is which is um, which is uh, bound in the end, so wind up, wound up in the end. So uh, I have no idea how to describe it, how to uh, go from this two to one orbits to this more complicated orbit. It must be some somehow related to this uh, winding up of the of these um, uh, displacement waves that that we have here uh, can i add something to, to, to that because yeah uh, well actually this bending wave picture is a collective picture let's say is in terms of waves on the disk but let us stick a bit on the to the orbits themselves let's say to, to see well actually if you make a 3d description of the disk let's say you have three frequencies i mean the, the fundamental frequencies would be let's say the the rotate the angular velocity the epicyclic frequency on the disk and the vertical frequency so whenever we say there are two frequencies actually in the x1 family you have already a resonance between the epicyclic frequency and the rotating, let's say, the angular velocity and so on. Yeah. So my question is, would that make things better if the analysis had been done in terms of three fundamental frequencies, including, let's say, as many as the numbers of degree of freedom instead of two frequencies, which would be one in the plane and one off plane? I don't know. I haven't tried, but <laughs> that's certainly a way to, to think about it. Okay, thank you. But my, my main question is, how do we go from this kind of orbit that I showed here to the pretzel orbits? So we, it has to, the, the bending wave has to affect this orbit in order to produce uh, this kind of orbit, right? To produce uh, this. Uh, right. Orbit. But let's say take that final orbit and check it face on also. I mean, the question is, it, is it still looking like a resonant orbit? So this is the this is uh, the face on view here on the top. Top right, you have the face on view. OK, so there you see there is no resonance already. I mean, you have three frequencies there. You have, let's say, two frequencies on the disk. There is a resonance uh, because this orbit, this particular orbit is here so it's uh, three to two in terms of uh, in the face on view so it's a kind of uh, fish or let's say something like this so it's not uh, the ellipse orbit but it's still okay i mean we need to discuss this more in more detail but i would say from the from the point of view of just checking the orbit the way it looks like i mean it doesn't look very resonant altogether 
the in the right in the left uh, let's say panel you clearly see something like a tube around an x1 orbit or so on the plane but in, right. in the left in the right one i wouldn't be able to distinguish any tube i mean it looks way it is, more it is there it's not very visible but it is three to one three to two uh, yes in, in this one in this uh, in the face on view yes it is and if you can see the resonances on that one yeah. Okay, so it's sitting in in this uh, in this peak here, mm. in the uh, y to x. And if you go one back, please, Eva. Mm. Yes, you can see it. That there's two, and then there's another one because there's another. Ah, they, they don't have the third frequency on this block. But yes, there is another paper who had this, uh, which had this diagrams, and they showed yeah. different. So this would be the two to one, and then there would be another two to one in the different plane. Yes, exactly. When yes. you plot, uh, so I ought, uh, actually noticed this also here uh, or here. When you when you plot this kind of frequency uh, plot for for this two, three to two, you will see another branch, but you will, when you look in this direction, mm -hmm. you will they will overlap. So this is the same thing. Uh, so this uh, this and this uh, peaks in in the face on view they they all come into this in the in this frequency ratio so it's 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 still there yes and in fact there is a paper that has done that quite um in detail uh as far as i remember it would have been around 2015 or 2016 something of that order and there is another Chinese, not Li. It's the Chinese uh, with the most normal the name is Wang. So it's Wang et al. Okay, I have a look. Yeah, Wang et al. And if you don't remember, the second one is me. So you would <laughs> you would find that one easier, perhaps. Okay. Good. Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, in the we have to have in mind that uh, whenever we are looking for orbits, we do not point to periodic orbits. So uh, a comment I have for the uh, orbits during the buckling states, if it is X1, V1, as we call it, or X1, V2, actually, I, we cannot say, for instance, this, because it's a matter of projection, and if you take uh, a quasi-periodic orbit around the stable X1, V1, or a nearby sticky orbit X1, V2, you get similar shapes. So actually, this doesn't matter because uh, it, it will be 2 to 1 in both cases. Or even if right. it is well aligned to the, uh, the side on view, and then you, do a, a, you view the same orbits from different angles, then you may get a, something like, like that goes towards an, infinite or h shape uh, structure. Uh, I believe that in the very beginning, uh, you almost see these banana-like orbits being there in the button phase. So, okay, even if you do not want, does not do any uh, frequency analysis, even by eye, you can see that it is uh, frown and smile. Uh, and they, 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 at the end, uh, there's, uh, after a while, there are both representatives there, uh, frown and smiles, I mean. And then actually what happens is that uh, the, the, due to any kind of perturbations, we do not have a, an analytic model, a time independent analytic model, then you get to uh, orbits that are that exist in the region. So I don't remember when was this paper, Leah, we had uh, together where we have uh, presented all these uh, second generation uh, bifurcations of X1, not only the 3D, etc. Correct, yes, you're right, yes. It was 2020, 2019, I don't remember. Uh, and uh, for me, it is something what, that uh, is understandable in this way. So you displace the initial condition of the orbit you study, and then you get, for instance, uh, the orbits that you had there with the Bretzel Levi, you can have this uh, uh, slide again uh, where, the, where the 
the, the banana likes together with uh, the orbits we discussed before, if they are resonant or not. These are typical, typical second generation uh, orbits in the region. So yes, yes, I agree. Might, uh, bring the initial condition of the orbit you study uh, to another nearby uh, position in the phase space, and then you get what you get. Now, it is very interesting what you said that, uh, I guess that you speak about the peanut component. So at the edges, still you can find the two to one, and then uh, closer to the center, uh, you have Bretzel or other kind of orbits. Right. But uh, uh, there is always a question that we tried several times to understand it by uh, populating different families, etc. Why the wings of the X sometimes cross to the center and sometimes do not. Maybe this is also another explanation so that uh, at the edge of the peanut, you have the two to one that give the wings of the X while in the middle, you have already this uh, this second generate, generation families that if you put several representatives of them together and you look how they look like, they do not make an X. And so you lose the X, but these are uh, half, let's say the peanut, then you have just the edges of uh, the X at the end. Maybe this is just a simple explanation. So just hitting the system, then you will not uh, be, let's say, if, if we speak about, let's say the easy solution about stable periodic orbits, you will not stake about, uh, 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 on the tori of the quasi periodic, you will be displaced a little bit farther out. And then, okay, this is what's gonna happen. Just for maybe the study, the study of the forty phase space would give some yes in a yes fixed you can you, you, uh, and find the characteristics yes of, and maybe this the, the would give some answers you uh, can do that of course but it is something also that one realizes even if you just uh, uh, study the two D orbits uh, on the plane and find the bifurcation you see that uh, you have all the other uh, the pretzel etc even on the plane it's there and then what happens in the vertical direction it's not always the same. I mean that you can have a frown that it is, uh, if you look face on, on the model, you will gonna have a, a kind of uh, bretzel looking or something that is not the typical ellipse of the X1 and the opposite. Mm -hmm. So all these combinations are available there. So model dependence are very strong in all these cases, mm -hmm. but probably if we see that in the outer part of the peanut, uh, whatever kind of uh, two to one uh, survives is there, then what I said before could be an explanation. Mm -hmm. And just remember that like in the uh, uh, spirals uh, on the face on views, they, they do not have the majority of the orbits there, but they just are those that are aligned in this way that they produce the structure. Maybe the same happens in the vertical and direction. Also, hmm. orbits, sticking uh, out orbits, yeah, okay. Do same... I don't mention them here not to complicate okay. the discussion, but it's the same as speaking same about regular, uh, regular. yeah, exactly. Like yeah, but my, my problem is that uh, at the beginning, as I, as I showed you, all the orbits lie, are like this, at the beginning of buckling. And mm -hmm. then it seems that it's not a random, some kind of random, you know, uh, bifurcation, changes of energy, and they, they become different uh, different orbits. It's a, some, some kind of systematic uh, variation that is caused by this, by this uh, bending wave. And this is what I want to grasp. I think it's it's uh, this this bending is is something that is uh, changing the orbits from this initial um, almost banana to to these uh, pretzels later on. Exactly. Then, if you, if yeah. you can, if so you what can... is causing this? What? How do you describe this kind of? It's a perturbation. It's a perturbation, as Leah says. If you can bring again the. The slide uh, of uh, the, the orbits you had, or the, the slide with uh, the uh, Porte orbits, we can uh, mm -hmm. say something more specific. Mm -hmm. This one or the other one with of Porte that you had. This one, for instance. So uh, all this uh, you we have at the bottom uh, the banana-like orbits, and the one that is uh, above, just above, it's also banana-like something. But the other orbits that you have are not random orbits in the area. These are the shapes of what you expect by perturbing uh, slightly the banana-like orbs. They are there in the phase space. Mm -hmm. 
So if you just displace the initial conditions uh, of the banana-like orbs, you will fall on these orbits. Mm. And of course you perturb it because it, you have an evolving system. And then it, either the pattern speed uh, uh, is uh, decreasing or the, uh, something happens with the amplitude. Okay, okay but it's, it's not a random perturbation, right? Because this banding right. wave is a very precise thing. Yeah. So, exactly and, and, and because of this, I think there is this kind of very tight relation, right? This this on the right, this very tight relation between the frequencies. If this was a random heating, uh, something like this, this would be the same as before, even even wider. But it's not, right? It's it's a very very tight at the. Well, that is a resonance. It yes, resonance. Of course, they are resonance uh, orbits, but yeah, but it's but, but it's not uh, resonances in terms of uh, z and x. Because if this was the case, we would just have islands here, right? We would not have a continuous uh, thing. So we would have, uh, we, we, would have this, we, we have these peaks yeah. here, right? So we have some resonances. But it's not that the, only the resonances are populated. It's always everything in between as well. And this is what populates this whole straight line. So there's a system. And everything is around the resonance. Around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, uh, Mirella was saying before, uh, mentioned the name sticky orbits, which I think there is uh, in most of these cases, exactly because of the time dependency, then of course we come into problems of uh, definitions. But okay, there are objects that look very similar to what we call sticky orbits in the autonomous cases. So this will be not perfect resonant uh, orbits because they are not uh, regular or they do not behave like a regular because we have the time dependency there, but there are shapes very close to them. But can okay. I add something to this panel? Sorry. Yeah. I think uh, I would probably agree with Leah on this. I mean, they are resonant. If they are resonant, they could just well be around the periodic orbit. Let's say take, and that's the only question here. Let's say if you have a stable periodic orbit, you don't expect any let's say, real orbit to be just exactly periodic. It could be quasi-periodic, but is if, it, if it is trapped around the periodic orbit, then when you compute the fundamental frequencies, you would just compute the frequencies of the periodic orbit itself. Yes. And, and I think that's all we see in the second plot in here, let's say in this. So there is a tight correlation which indicates the frequency of the periodic orbit itself. So it means you have thin cubes around that. You still get the frequencies of the periodic orbit out of the, let's say, a, a numerical computation of the frequencies. Yeah, and that you see with this kind of plots. But my question is, do we always see that? Because in the other plot that we were seeing before, let's say before and after buckling, there was another case in which it didn't seem to be so. In the right panels, not the left panels. It's in the, in, probably in the transparency before. Uh, uh, yeah, no. Be, no, no, before that, in the histograms of the frequencies again. Oh, this is below this. Yeah. There, right. I mean, I speak about the second column, not the first one. Mm -hmm. There are some peaks here, right? Well, I would not claim that. I mean, it looks fundamentally different what happens in the right column from what happens in the left column. So I guess it's not always this scenario. I mean, you have cases where it seems that you still have the buckling. I mean, there is something fundamental around the value two, but then everything means that, I mean, it, after the buckling, you just have non-resonant orbits again, but of different nature. While in the first case is what we were discussing before. Yeah, and I think this is what was in that paper, if I remember correctly, I, the one I told you about before. It, and you, all you have to do is take the frequencies because that is the easy, well, the easy, the one we know about how to how to get or go about. And so you would have like a omega one, omega two, and an omega three, and you, you use something like um, 
of the works of uh, Lascar or something like that. And, and then you see exactly that. And there are two to three of those. Yeah, there is a very interesting discussion. We can continue if there is someone else who wants to have a comment or something. Can see a raised hand or something. Uh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, there is, there are a lot of things that can be discussed about uh, exactly what brings the structures we observe, and uh, I think there is some still some way to go until we have a good understanding of the details. Uh, if uh, no one else has something to add, then we can uh, thank again. That it was a great talk. That's what I'm going to add. I didn't have time to add it yet. Very, 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 very interesting. Uh, so thank you very much, Eva. Thank you very much again. Thank you. And sorry, <laughs> my camera is out of order, so I cannot really. Uh, um, okay. Uh, let's hope that we have the opportunity soon to meet for emails and uh, Zoom meetings. We will be able to continue the, the discussion. So, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much for your feedback. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye to everyone. Bye. And the meeting for all. Yeah.